Um, my mom wanted me to ask you a question. Sure. What's up? Uh, so we sent them uh, files to Cam. Is that what we're supposed to do? That works just fine. If she um, if she got ones for this camp, she'll send them over to me. So you're good. All right. Yes, ma'am. Man, I'm so je jealous, Miller family. Every time I see you coming back from the pool and I'm sitting here in a sweatshirt in my house in front of a computer. <laughs> we have, I have seven kids during the summer, so we swim as much as we can. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Our apartment has a pool and I've only been like twice this summer. They live in the pool. Freeman. Um, I'm the environmental coordinator for the Citizen Potawatomi Nation. I've been there for about two years. Um, like Tasha said, I'm also a Citizen Potawatomi, so I've grown up around the tribe and gone to all the festivals and probably did a lot of the stuff that you guys are familiar with doing. Um, a little bit about, about me and my background. I grew up in Shawnee, Oklahoma, so all of you are probably local, am I right? For the most part, okay. Um, and so I graduated from Tecumseh High School, and after I graduated, I did the internship with the Potawatomi Leadership Program. Are any of you guys familiar with that? Yes, I see some head shakes. Okay, so I did that, um, and I did the internship for a summer, and lo and behold, I discovered the environmental department at the tribe, which I did not know existed. So it op actually opened up a lot of um, ideas about what I wanted to do when I got done with college. So I went to OSU. Um, I got my undergrad in zoology, um, which is the study of animals. And then I decided that I wanted to go to grad school because when I was in undergrad, I had a bunch of passionate professors who were talking about really important issues like water um, and protecting the environment. And I felt like I still had a lot to learn before I decided to um, start working for a place. And since I did the Potawatomi Leadership Program, I knew I wanted to come back to the tribe or a tribe. So I wanted to gain some experience that was a little more broad and focused on more than just animals, um, which I think is something that's um, important that you learn now at this age, because I think when we talk about working with, animals or the environment a lot of us just think we're going to be veterinarians we think that's our only option and that's how i started when i was an undergrad i thought okay i want to be a veterinarian um, i didn't know there were other things that meant i could work outside or be around water or the earth or animals besides being a vet so that was really something that i learned in college and interning that there are more options than just that so um i went to grad school at osu and studied environmental science. And that's where I learned about water and plants and insects um, and all the things that I ended up bringing back to the tribe. And I think it was really um, important for me to learn that there are so many options for you to find something that you're interested in, things you can do. Don't limit yourself or put yourself in a small box. Um, do some research, find out what you're passionate about and learn about it. Um, and you'll never work a day in your life, hopefully. It's still work, but it's fun work and it's interesting work. So, uh, I've introduced myself. Um, I should probably tell you what I do for the tribe. So, I'm the environmental coordinator. Um, that means that I help manage our grants. So, we have a water grant, so I water sample every month. Um, I also do macro invertebrate sampling two times a year where I go out and collect insects. Um, I'm in charge of air quality, so anything pertaining to air for the tribe, um, I address things like that. I help other departments, so when we do construction projects, um, there's a thing called the National Environmental Policy Act, and if you're using federal funding, you have to adhere to those guidelines that basically make sure that any activity we're doing doesn't harm the environment or harm people. So I do help other departments with that. And what else? Um, 
And that's pretty much about it. Every day is a little different, um, but if you can think of something that involves the environment or environmental problem solving, um, I kind of help with that. So now I think I would like all of you guys to, I think, introduce each of you. Um, I think one of your tasks was to find an insect to take a photo of it, I believe. So if you did that, go ahead and show me your insect. And then I'd like you to tell me if you like bugs. Um, and if you do, tell me if you like bugs. And if you don't, tell me why not. And I'll, I'll help facilitate this, Lexi. So I'm gonna just go down the registration or the okay. participant list. And so um, I'm gonna just go in the order I see on my screen. So when I call on you, if you're not already sharing your screen, if you'll share your screen and show us the bug that you either collected or took a picture of and then answer Lexi's question. Um, so I'm gonna start with Alden and Ainsley. I did not collect a bug. I couldn't find any that were not ants. And so I don't not like bugs, but I don't exactly like them either. Okay. Also, his name is Aiden. Gotcha. Nice to meet you. Thank you. It's a, I think the I is capitalized on the, the participant list here. That's why I thought it was Alvin. <laughs> Thank you. Um, all right, Ainsley. Well, I could find, I think I found a dragonfly and I took a picture on it, but it's not very high resolution. It's on my um, DS and I couldn't get very close because it, the DS doesn't allow me, it told me not to um, let it, put it in direct sunlight. And since the dragonfly was in sunlight, I couldn't get very close. Still but, count. I'm sorry, I don't have, also I do. I'm okay with bugs, but I hate arachnids. Me too. <laughs> um, let's see, Miller family. These are our bugs that we collected. Nice. <laughs> I like bugs because well, I like catching them because I get to I get to like look at them and look at their beauty and stuff. I like to catch bugs. Awesome. Get out of the pool. And can you tell Lexi each of your names? I'm Kylie. And I'm Raylan. Brianna and Ashlyn. Nice to meet you all. Nice to meet you too. And they said earlier they caught they found those in their pool. Oh, nice. Yeah. All right, Blaine. I like bugs because I've always seen grasshoppers hopping around everywhere when I've been like walking in my yard. I've some cubs just hop away, and I, my mom, took a picture of one and I'm trying to get it up now. And we can come back to you if you need to keep looking for it, Blaine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Tell me just tell me whenever you found it, all right? Yeah. Um, let's see, Bryden. And you're muted, Bryden. We went to Grandma's, Grandma D's yard and I got a picture of a bee. It's not very good, but it's a bee. Nice. And bugs are good as long as they're not wasps. That's fair. I don't know if any of you have been to the Eagle Aviary, but one of the ladies that work there, if you've met them, they said that they've been having a wasp issue and gotten stung several times this week by wasps. 
<laughs> Let's see. Okay. Um, I'm just calling the names as they're showing up. So this might be parents' names, but um, Damien is my next one on the list. It's a dragonfly, it's blue. Nice, very good. Very cool, thank you, Blaine. Margaret's pond. Awesome. Okay, I'm looking at the screen. Oh. I think Damien maybe stepped away for a minute, so we'll call on him in a moment. Um, Dejanya. I didn't really find any bugs, but I like bugs. Awesome, thank you. Um, Mahela. It's a dragonfly that's kind of blurry. Very good. Those are hard to photograph too. Good job. Very cool. Um, let's see. Then I have Harper. I found this um, fuzzy ant. I think it's a fire ant maybe. It is a, they're called a cow killer. And don't, don't let it sting you. Those are painful. And I like bugs as long as they're like, I don't really like holding them though. I like to look at them though, because they look. Gotcha, that's fair. Um, let's see, uh, Jack and Riley. Uh, my cousin is with me too, and we each have our own pictures. Oh, yeah. Oh, good one. A swallowtail. Yeah, I took that in my 4-H garden. Nice. All-nighters. This is a grasshopper? Yeah, love that. Thank you. And then do you all like bugs? Yeah, yeah, we've been learning about, like, the pollinators and stuff this year for the garden. Awesome. Great. Um, let's see. Um, I have James Rubido. Oh, we got no picture, but no. Um, I got no picture of, of a bun, but um, I hate. I like okay. spiders, but not big spiders. Okay, we'll try to change your mind. Give me, give me 45 minutes. Uh, and tell me your names. Uh, mine's Alicia. Mine's James. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Um, all right, Talbot boys. Jason, Braden, Dylan. You'll have to turn on your camera and unmute yourselves. I caught something. Oh, whoa. I got All right. Eye. Corbella, if you want to go ahead and go, then go for it, and then we'll come back to the Talbot boys in a second. So I named him Bob. Nice. He's a fly. Okay. And You'll I learn about him. I want to get a Bob friend. Well, I'll just send you. Okay. Thank you. All right, Jason, Braden, Dylan, you're still on deck. But for the meantime, what about Micah? I got a picture of a dragonfly. A blue one. Okay.
Oh. Bring it back to the screen just a little bit. Very cool. Hey. Awesome. All right, Talbot boys. Uh. Can't really see it that good, but. Uh, it's a picture of cricket. That's a grasshopper. Grasshopper. My bad. <laughs> awesome. And what do you guys feel about bugs? Uh, Jason likes to use them for bait. Okay, for fishing. <laughs> for fishing. That works. Awesome. It would work great for crop. Mm -hmm. I've caught lots of crop grasshoppers to fish with. Um, let's see. Then Landon. Oh, nice. Thank you. Thank you, Dylan. All right. Um, I. Go ahead, Landon. All right. Um, I, I, I took a picture of, uh, the praying mantis. Oh, very good. Those are some fun ones. Yeah, good job. Thank you, Landon. Um, okay, and Julian. I don't have a picture, but sometimes I see spiders around my driveway and porch. Okay. Yeah. Good job. Thank you. What do you do when you What do you do when you see them, Julian? Uh, nothing. I just leave them be. You're brave. Do you like <laughs> Do you, do you like bugs? Uh, yeah, they're pretty cool. Um, and Logan. Logan, your screen is black and you're muted. So if you happen to come back, let us know. And you can, oh, there you go. He messaged that his mic doesn't work, but he has an American stag beetle and I tried to move its pinchers, but they are holding on really tight. I'm indifferent to bugs, but I really like beetles. That's a good one though. That's a good find, I'm jealous. Lexi's done a lot of research on certain types of beetles. <laughs> Yeah, stag beetle, that's impressive. And then we have uh, Marley. Hi, um, I saw a dragonfly, but it flew away before I could get a picture, so, oh well. <laughs> you but tried. I, I tried. And then I'm indifferent about bugs. I don't mind them. I just don't like them on me a lot. Some are okay, but like, I don't like wasps. That's understandable. All righty. Um, Nokos. Oh, I couldn't get one, a picture of one because we went to the store, but I'm pretty sure I know where like some spiders are though. Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, Robbie. Nice, a weevil? Mm-hmm. Good job. And can you tell us what you all are messaging me? How do you say Bug and Potawatomi? Nadosha. Nadosha. Sha. Nadosha? Nadosha. Nadosha. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. And um, I believe last one will be Scotland. 
Um, I don't have a picture of bugs, but I have mealworms for my gecko. Yeah, I feed them mealworms. So they're pretty cool. Oh. I like bugs. Good. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Did we miss anybody? My list was moving around. So if I missed you, go ahead right now. Otherwise, we'll move on to the next part. Okay, well then I'm gonna jump in. Um, so, I like bugs. My name is Lexi and I like bugs. Um, as Tasha mentioned, when I was in grad school, I actually researched the American bearing beetle. Um, it's one of the only endangered species in Oklahoma. Um, and so, when I was doing my graduate studies, when I started the program, I didn't know a lot about entomology. And so I kind of had to do a two year crash course because I was studying this insect and I was writing a thesis on it. Um, so I kind of accidentally fell in love with bugs and uh, now I'm pretty passionate and excited about them. And that's a little weird to some people, but I'm gonna convert all of you and hopefully you all love insects by the end of this. So here we go. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay, and tell me if that looks right. Can y'all see it? Let's switch this to gallery view. I see head nods. Okay, so entomology. It's a branch of zoology that studies insects. And I'm going to minimize this. We're going to do... So are you guys familiar with etymology? No, head shake, okay. So that's the study of the origin of words. And so when you learn the scientific name of something, usually it has kind of a complicated name, entomology. That sounds a little different, sounds a little com complicated. Um, if you break it down though, it's a little easier to understand though. So if you break it down, entomon means insect in ancient Greek, and then Logia means study of. So we combine those together and entomology means the study of insects. You guys might have learned this in school. Um, I know we have a bunch of different age ranges here, but everything is classified. Every living thing is grouped into groups of things that are similar to. So you have kingdom, then phylum, then class, then order, family, genus, and species. And if any of you guys have questions, just go ahead and interrupt me and unmic yourself because I can't really see all of you right now with my presentation up. So feel free to interrupt me, ask me questions. So we're talking about insect classification. So insects are in the kingdom, Animalia, phylum, arthropoda, which make up insects, your spiders, and your crustaceans. So spiders actually aren't considered insects. They're arachnids. Um, and then we break it farther down into class, which we're gonna be talking about class insecta. And then there are tons of orders. There's a ton of families, and then there's a ton of different genuses and species. Um, so right now it's estimated there's about 900,000 insects, um, different species. And there's probably more, that's just the ones that we know of. 900,000, that's a lot. There's actually 10 quintillion insects alive, if we estimate that. That's a lot. Um, and then in the US, there's 91,000 different species of insects. So it's a big, um, entomology is a big, a big field of study. So phylum arthropoda, what makes an arthropod an arthropod? It has jointed legs, it has a segmented body, and an exoskeleton. And so, like I said, this falls into spiders, insects, and crustaceans. All these guys have this. Lexi, what's a crustacean? A crustacean is like a crab or a lobster, or um, you guys talked about your, your uh, archaeology yesterday. So he probably talked about some of the, the fossilized ocean species out there. A lot of those are crustaceans. Okay, so then we're in class insecta. So what makes an insect an insect? Does anybody again wanna spit something out? How is maybe an insect different from a spider? It has three parts of its 
and six legs. There you go. Yeah. Anybody else? No, that's okay. So three pairs of jointed legs. As you know, a spider has four pairs. A body with three segments. One pair of antenna. Ooh. And then that's all of your insects. Okay, so there are a ton of different insect orders, but today I'm gonna talk about the top ones that you're gonna see the most often. I'm gonna teach you how to identify what insect is from what order. Um, and then you can sound super cool when someone shows you a bug and you're like, oh nice, that's a Lepidoptera. Or, oh, that's a housefly. And that, you can actually say, mom, that's actually Diptera. So it, it works, it's a good trick, people enjoy it. So we're gonna talk about Coleoptera, Lepidoptera, Hymenoptera, Orthoptera, Diptera, and Hemiptera. And by the end of this, you'll be able to know what's what, um, and I'll teach you a few insects from each order. So Coleoptera, we're gonna break it down um, using etymology and it makes it easier to remember. So Coleo means sheep, Turon means wing, you're gonna see that a lot. And these order of insects are characterized as having a pair of hardened wings. Can anybody guess what type of insects you'll see in this order? Hardened wings. Maybe like a June bug? Hey, your beetles. So this is the order that all of the beetles are gonna fall into. And if you notice, they do have those hard wings. They're not very flimsy. Um, they're not super pretty. Um, these are your beetle family. So you have your weevils, your June bugs, uh, your so soldier beetles, that stag beetle that someone found. Those are all Coleoptera. All right, Lepidoptera. Lepid means scale. The Turon again means wing. And this one is characterized as having two large wings covered in small scales. Can anybody guess what this one is? Um, I have a guess. Butterfly. And what is, your, what is your guess? Maybe a dragonfly. Okay, good guess. These are your butterflies and moths, and you typically call them scale wings. So these are all of these guys. Lepidoptera. Okay, then we have hymenoptera. Hymen means membrane, turon means wing, and it's characterized as having two pairs of thin, clear, membranous wings. Any guesses on this one? That is a good guess. These ones and damselflies? It's a good guess. This one gets a little more fuzzy. It's actually everything that you guys don't like. The bees, wasps, and ants. Oh. Because if you think about it, they do have a thin, membranous wing. Oh yeah, they do. Mm -hmm. what, would you, what would you say membranous means, Lex? I, when you can see the veins, that's what I think of. So if you look at a butterfly's wings, you can see the segments of it and the lines that run through it. That's how I would think about it. But some of these scientific names do kind of get a little pretty similar. So orthoptera, ortho or straight, turon wing, Four wings, the front one is thickened, and then it has a jumping hind leg. What do you think these guys are? Grasshopper. Grasshopper. Yeah, good job. These are your grasshoppers, your crickets, and your katydids, which a lot of you guys found. Orthoptera. You guys want to repeat it after me? Orthoptera. 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 All right, then we have Diptera, the most hated order of insects. Uh, di means two, Turon means wings. This one has one pair of wings. The second is smaller and often hidden. What do you guys think this one is? Well, Maybe fly? Dragonfly. 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 Fly. Flies. Mosquitoes. They're, every, they're the flies, the midges, and the mosquitoes, everything that annoys you. Yay, got it. So Wait, that, what's that? Oh. 
Did someone have a question? Uh, was it, did, did someone have a question? I see you, Talbot, so you're unmuted. Did you have a question? Or Blaine? All Blaine, right. You, all right. Then I'll keep going. All right, Hemiptera. Hemi means half, Turon means wing. There's a triangle on the back behind the head and this forms the wing. This one isn't as common. So what do you guys think? This one's a little tough. These are your true bugs, your cicadas, and your aphids. And these get confused a lot with beetles because they do look like they kind of have a hardened wing. So these are all of these guys. So if you look at the back of the neck, do you notice that triangle their wings make? That's how you know that bug is gonna be a hemiptera. And so usually you guys, if any of you guys have gardens of squash bugs that like to destroy everything, that's a hemiptera. Okay. So, let's see, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen. Well, I can keep it up. What I'd like you guys to do now is I want you to pull out that butterfly that you guys were given. And I would like you to grab your book. And what do you guys think, What what is the, what's the butterfly? What, what order is that? And anybody can chime in, what order is the butterfly? Can you share your screen with the options again, Lexi? Oh yeah, that's smart. Okay, we're gonna go to this guy. Lepidope. The second one? Yeah, it's a Lepidoptera. And you guys say it with me because these are kind of hard to say. I'm going to run through them really quick and you can say them and repeat after me because they're something that you read and it kind of takes you saying them to, to learn how to properly pronounce it. So, Coleoptera. Coleoptera. Coleoptera are your beetles. Lepidoptera. 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 Yeah, those are your butterflies and moths. Then you have Hymenoptera. 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 Those are your bees, your wasps, your ants. Then we have Orthoptera. 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 Grasshoppers and your katydids. Then Diptera. 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 Those are all the annoying guys, your flies, your midges, and your mosquitoes. And then your Hemiptera. Hemiptera. And those are your true bugs. And I didn't mention it, but, um, and it's not included in this, but a lot of you guys said dragonflies. Those will actually be order Odonata. O-D-O, Odonata. Odonata, it's your dragonflies. Okay. So, whip out your butterfly, whip out your book. And what I'd like for you to do is see if you can identify what type of butterfly you have by going through your book. So if you go to your tab, if you go to page, I think it's nine, it'll show you your different insect options. And we've already figured out that it's going to be a butterfly. So then it says butterflies and moths, page 75. So if you guys will go to page 75 and take a look and try to figure out what kind of butterfly you guys have. Page 75 has milkweed butterflies, um, gossamer winged butterflies, Swallowtails, shrimp skippers, brush footed butterflies. Is it an orange sculpture? It's actually on page six, 
77. And you guys will you guys will have to flip through a few pages because it does go over quite a few. So pages. I think I know. Okay, what do you think it is? Is it an orange sulfur? What does everybody else think? There's such thing as a cabbage butterfly. <laughs> That's weird. Here. What was the last year? Come out here. Orange. Sulfur. Okay, so raise your hand if you think it's an orange sulfur. Yeah. Wave it. Wave it. All right, good job. Yeah, it's an orange sulfur. Yes. So what's handy about this book is it doesn't go into scientific names or it doesn't help you classify an insect, but this one is really handy if you can go on to page eight. Um, and if you have a bug that you don't know what it is, you go to page eight. And then you can figure out what type of order it is. So if you have a beetle, um, you know it's Coleoptera, go to this handbook, go to the page it tells you all your beetles are on. And this book is really good because it breaks all of your stuff down and it shows you really good examples of what all of your insects could be. So this is actually a really handy tool to identify insects. All right, so I think, what do I want to do now? Do you guys have any questions for me? Corbella, you had a question earlier about your um, box. Oh, yeah, I'm just going to use a mason jar whenever I catch them. OK. You were also asking, though, why somebody would want to kill a bug and keep it. Yeah. OK, that is a good question. So for me, um, one thing that I have is an insect collection. Um, and what it helps me do is I keep, it's basically, and I can show it to you. It's actually quite large. So. I think one of the flies I caught has mites. It could be, they're pretty dirty bugs. So I have a whole insect collection. And so what it is, is it kind of helps you study insects up close because so I have some wasps in here I have some bees in here um, I have some beetles with big pinchers and what that lets me do is get up close and study them and classify them so that's why some people have insect collections other people might kill them because they're pests um, you don't like mosquitoes biting you people don't like bugs eating their vegetables from a vegetable plant um, so there are a lot of reasons that some people do kill insects Does anybody else have questions? No? Okay, so then what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna pull some bugs out of my collection and then I'm gonna want you guys to help me identify them. So. Let's see, what do I wanna do first? Okay. What is this? And let's start with the order and I can repeat them for you. I don't think I can share a screen and show you the bug, but we had Coleoptera, Lepidoptera, Orthoptera, Hymenoptera, Hemiptera, and Diptera. What do you think this one is? The Orthoptera? And I see some of you trying to talk and you're muted. Orthoptera? Orthoptera? So those are grasshoppers and our katydids. So that's a good guess. Giant snag beetle. Very good. So it's coleoptera. It's a beetle. Were you guys able to find that in your book? Did you find that in your book, Landon? What page was it on? Unmute yourself. To 66, 67, I mean. Good job. All right, we're gonna do another one. Are you ready? 
How do you find bugs that big? This is just a plain old cicada. So these are all over the place. They're not that big. <laughs> I have a bunch. There's a fly on my microscope. Cicadas are very noisy. Cute. What was that plane? Cicadas are very noisy. They are, they're very noisy. Okay, so if you guys been able to find that one in your book? I see you have it pulled up. Good job, okay. Okay, okay. What Let's page was it, in case you didn't find it? You gotta unmute yourself, Mahala. Forty-seven. Oh, Forty-seven. Oh, Bye. All right. Let's see. What do I want to show you next? Let's do. What is that guy? Can you get a, a little bit closer? Yeah. Okay, so remember it has the jumping back legs, two sets of wings, and then a thickened front leg. This is our orthoptera. Grasshopper? You're close. These are a little hard to tell the difference between. Katie did. So Katie did. Good job. And what page was that? 27, I think. Good job. So hopefully you guys have learned that identifying insects is pretty easy. Okay, so now I'm going to show you how to start an insect collection. So do you guys want to go ahead and show me all the stuff you got? Nice. Okay, good job. Okay, and then, so you guys, correct me if I'm wrong, you got a box, you got a magnifying glass, you got a net, you got your handbook, Yeah. and your butterfly. Yes. Okay. So, what you do when you catch an insect? You see an insect, let's start. You see an insect. You want to catch it, what do you do? Net. You grab your bug net. And I'm going to tell you a secret. If you find any grass that's really high and you want to catch bugs and you're not seeing them, there are bugs everywhere. There are 10 quintillion bugs on earth right now. So all you have to do is sweep that net through the grass. That's going to help you're going to find all of your bugs. Okay, so you have a bug. Now what do you do? Any guesses? You catch it. You catch it. Put it yeah. in a box. You put it in a jar. Yeah, so then what you're gonna do is you're gonna get a jar. I have little jars where you can get a big mason jar. And what you're gonna do is you get a little cotton ball and grab a little bit of rubbing alcohol, just a little, and put that on your cotton ball. Then you're going to put your bug and the cotton ball into a mason jar, seal it shut. And that's how you euthanize your insects. You can pin it. You can also put them in your freezer. If you have like a baggie, if you have them in a mason jar, you don't have rubbing alcohol, you can put them in your freezer and that puts them to sleep too. If you look in mine, I have a whole side of my freezer that's full of bugs. Your parents might not appreciate it or your siblings, but that works too. So, Lexi. Can yes. you talk about, can you explain what, what euthanize means? And then can you also talk about if they find a bug that they know is dangerous, how do they handle that? Yes, that's good. Okay, so euthanize just means that's how you would kill your insect humanely. So when we catch a bug, the idea is that you want it so you can pin it and look up close and study it. Well, you can't yeah. smush a bug or smash it like you normally would a fly or something that you're scared of, a spider. Um, and so what you want to do when you kill them is you want to do it in a way that preserves them. So putting them in the freezer or using your isopropyl alcohol 
um, in a mason jar, that, that's how you do that. Um, insects that look like they're gonna sting you, so your bees, your wasps, that velvet ant, the velvet ant somebody found, the cow killer, the red velvety one, those I wouldn't recommend you try to catch because those are gonna sting you. Um, I would leave that to people who are more comfortable catching insects. Um, so I would stick to your butterflies, your dragonflies, your grasshoppers, things that aren't gonna sting you, cause an allergic reaction or hurt you, okay? Sound good? Nod with me, don't go try to catch the wasp in your backyard. That was a good point, Tasha. thank you. <laughs> okay, so you have your bug. You've left it in your freezer or in your mason jar with rubbing alcohol overnight. Now you wanna pin it. I'm gonna show you really quick how to pin an insect. Some of them are harder than others, but we're gonna pick an easy one. So I have a few examples. So we have our cicada. What we're gonna do is, and you guys, I don't know what your kit came with. Did it come with pins? Your little? Yes. Okay. This is actually gonna be hard to show you on camera. So you have your bug on your styrofoam, right? The way that I like to pin my insects is slightly to the right. So I'm gonna put my pin right to the right of it, the middle of its skeleton and press down. That way your pin isn't blocking anything important. And I'll show you once I have it pinned. Okay. Logan says he got his stag beetle pinned. Very good. So this is what it's going to look like once you have it pinned. And then what this lets you do is now, if you want to take it off, you're not touching it or damaging it. It's already in place. It's perfect for you to look all around it. You got your pin. My nails are in the way. It's all pinned good for you. Any questions? Does it get like sad whenever you kill the bugs? So sometimes I do. Um, and it depends also on the insect. So you don't want to catch anything that's endangered or threatened. Um, cicadas, there's quite a few of them. So yeah, some of them I do. And if you feel if sad. If I fly, I'd be very sad. <laughs> well, and if it does make you sad to kill a bug, don't kill it. You don't have to. Enjoy it. Let it sit on its flower and hang out and appreciate it and then say bye and let it fly away. This is just if you want to start a collection. Um, or study insects or look up close on them. Okay, so we have that one pinned. What do we want to talk? Does anybody else have questions about pinning bugs? What was the first bug that you ever caught and pinned? So when I was in high school, I took a zoology course class, um, and I had to do a collection where I had to collect. I think it was 20 bugs. And I think the first one I caught was one of those little white butterflies you see around a pond. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Yes. I think that was the first insect I ever caught. But I remember I really liked that project in high school because I had a whole collection and I was super proud of them. I also have another question. Uh, okay. What was the most recent bug that you caught? Oh, you guys will appreciate this one. Okay. I thought this was going to be boring, but it's actually really interesting. So this one, wait, we found in the back of our truck. Did it jump out? No, I still. Oh, where did we get it? <gasps> what happened? And this is the Cecropia moth. It's the largest Native American moth. That's so pretty. I said Native American, North American moth. <laughs> <laughs> So this is one I'm really excited about. It was the last one we found. I'm super proud of it. Okay. So cool. Lexi also, um, Logan mentioned in the chat box, because his mic doesn't work, was that project from Mrs. Hayworth's class? Yes. That's his mom. Oh my gosh, I love her so much. That was so fun. 
You'll have to tell her I said hello. I okay. I think it looks like a bird at first. It does. It does. And its wings kind of look like a snake, too. So I'm going to jump back into the screen share. I know we're running short on time. And I'm going to finish up this presentation. While you're doing that, I have another question for you. OK. What's your favorite bug to catch? Favorite bug to catch? I think dragonflies are really satisfying because they're hard to catch. So once you actually get one, it's just like, mm, gotcha. Those I'm proud of. Those are tough ones. He does that a lot. Yeah. The other night we just saw him like running around in the grass and going, and then he's like, wait, I didn't get it. Oh man. Yeah, those are fun. Okay, so then why should we care about insects? I don't know. Does anybody have, why, why should we? worry about bees dying or um urbanization we need them we need them right so they do a bunch of fun stuff we have a pollinators so your bees all those guys they pollinate for us they also help control other insect populations so there's your ladybug eating an aphid and aphids can be annoying because they like to eat plants and grains and so those help us out. Aerate the soil. So we got those guys. Keeps our soil nice and healthy. If anybody composts, they know that if you have worms in your compost, you're doing good. They scavenge and they recycle. So this is actually the beetle I studied in grad school, the American burying beetle. And what it does is it finds dead things. So it finds the roadkill or the thing that something left behind after it started to eat it. And basically what it does is it will roll the rat or the pigeon or the rabbit into a ball and then bury it underground. And what it'll do is it lays its eggs around that carcass. And when the babies hatch, they feed on it and basically utilize that resource that would have been left in the open to decompose or to attract flies and spread disease. So some of our guys do things like that that are important that people don't think about. And then they're food for other living things. So I'm sure a lot of us wonder, well, wouldn't we be better off if ticks or mosquitoes didn't exist? Well, some things eat ticks and mosquitoes. So what happens to the bats? What happens to um, things like these little fish who are eating mosquito larvae? Another thing that they're important for is they tell us about our environment. They can be our indicator species that let us know if something's going wrong. And so that's actually why I utilize them in my work. So every two, two times a year, I do a winter sample and I do a summer sample. And I go to two sites that I've randomly selected and I go and I catch macroinvertebrates. And basically what this tells me is, if there's um, basically, let's see. So I'll go out, I'll have a net. I'll set my timer for five minutes and I'll sweep the bank of the stream, the stream. I'll scrub the roots, um, I'll scrub any trees I find, and then I'll collect those insects. Then I send those guys to OSU and there's a professor there who helps me analyze the insects I find. And basically what it is, is depending on what insects I find or don't find, it can tell me how healthy my water body is. Does anybody got, have an idea of why, how they show me? So if I'm at a stream and I don't catch any bugs, I don't catch any macroinvertebrates, what does that let me know? Um, maybe it means that all of them died because your water isn't like healthy enough for them. Yeah. If, if I'm not seeing any insects in my, my stream or my creek, um, it lets me know that there's a problem, that the water isn't flowing, the water's too warm, maybe there's some toxins, it's low oxygen, and it's not supporting these guys. If I find a stream that's full of things, if I find them full of water bugs and striders, and down at the bottom we have dragonfly larvae, nymphs, um, we have beetles, we have mayflies, we have caddisflies. If I catch so many of these guys, I know that my stream is fairly healthy. If I catch some of them, 
and not others that might tell me, well, my dragonfly nymphs can handle quite a bit of pollution. So I may catch a ton of dragonfly nymphs and not find any caddisflies. So that might tell me my water is okay, but it could be better because my caddisflies can't live in this water. So that's how I use them in my job to figure out if water is good or bad or needs to be remediated or fixed. So how can we help insects? Plant native shrubs and flowers. If you guys go and you're updating your flower bed or you go to Lowe's and you wanna buy a plant, why don't you take a look and see if you can find something native that'll help your pollinator friends. Um, avoid pesticides, herbicides, and artificial fertilizers if you can. So maybe if your family sprays for mosquitoes every year, maybe span it out wider, take a break from it. Um, for you guys that maybe don't have a backyard or a big space to do a flower bed, create mini habitats on your roof, your balcony, or your windowsill. Um, you can also support insect corridors. So if you drive down the highway in Stillwater, what they've actually done is they don't mow near the highway because it actually creates a corridor for the monarch butterflies. So things like that are things people are doing that's really neat and cool. Provide water if you have a bird bath or a fountain. And plant milkweed if you guys have a large area and you can plant milkweed, that'll help your monarch butterflies. And that is all I have. I know that, um, Tasha, you guys wanted to talk about some other stuff. Did anybody have some last minute questions for me? Um, I did. Okay. What's the most rare color of bug that you like ever find? Most rare color of bug. Probably white. I don't think I've ever really seen a white bug besides a butterfly. That's pretty rare. So, green bugs, are they like super common? I would say so. Because like, I imagine that if they're green, they can probably like blend in better. So that like- Exactly. Other thing. Yeah, so if you think about it, if your bugs are kind of a more boring color, like a drab brown or a green or a black, they do blend in better. They're less susceptible to being eaten. So they're survivors. Yeah. Okay, probably have time for maybe one more question if anyone has any. Is there like a good way to get rid of squash bugs off of plants in the garden? So I know some people use diatomaceous earth and that's actually organic and it doesn't hurt other, other things for the most part. Um, I know that some people have mentioned that they plant marigolds, the flower. I haven't tried it myself, but that's supposed to help. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a question. Okay. Once you get the bug inside your net, how do you keep it inside your net? So what you want to do is, I can show you that really quick. So usually what you do is you have your net, you're going to funnel it towards the bottom. And then once you have it like this, typically, I don't have a jar with me, you would hold your jar and you would invert it into the jar like that. Oh, that's Does cool. that make sense? Yeah. Spider, like, is the only spiders you can get is if they're like crawling on the ground? The only spider you can get is if it's crawling on the ground. You can is grab. It, like I'm thinking, maybe maybe the questions about the net. I mean the web. Oh yeah. Um. I mean, typically something. I don't usually catch spiders because. Well, the other thing that I should mention is things that are squishy. Those are those aren't going to hold on to a pin and onto a onto your board. So like imagine if I pinned a worm on here. Your worm is gonna shrivel up and look pretty bad. Your spiders are pretty juicy, the body is, so they're gonna shrivel up. What you wanna do with those if you do decide to preserve it is something like this. This is actually um, one of the macroinvertebrates we found in a creek but you want to put it in a vial with alcohol. 
and that kind of lets you see the body and it doesn't shrivel up it stays hydrated for you Oh, that's cool. <clears throat> Our friend caught a dragonfly. Nice. I wonder if you can see it. I wonder if they felt as proud as my cat did wherever he ate a fly. <clears throat> that's awesome. So correct me if I'm wrong, Robert, but I believe the Potawatomi word for dragonfly is Boshkwansi. Okay, any other last minute questions for Lexi? And, and Lexi, if you have time, I'd love for you to stick around in case any questions come up before we wrap up. Yeah. Okay, well, let's tell Lexi thank you and then we'll hand it over to Charles. Thanks, Lexi. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Wait, I have one more question. Thank you. Oh, you have one last question. Thank yes. you. Have you ever like named a bug like how I named a fly Bob? I don't usually name my bugs, no. Might have to start doing that. It's fun. <laughs> they get a personality. I'll have to do that. Even if they are stuck on a board. Yeah. You could put like little name tags above them. There you go. Yeah. All right. Oh, go ahead. Someone else had a question real quick. Who was that? Mahela? Do you have a favorite bug, Lexi? Mahela was asking. My favorite bugs would probably be, I like a bumblebee. I like my order uh, Hymenoptera, my bumblebees. Awesome. Thank you. All right. We're going to kick it over to Charles real quick, but Lexi will stay on the line. Charles, take it away. <coughs> yeah, that's one way to get the thing started. Let me just start coughing. Uh, I guess time for Rona. Let's get this bit going. Uh, OCO, Bojo, and hello, everyone. Hope you're doing well. So we've had five days of this. What did you folks think? Okay. Good. Yeah, some thumbs ups. All right, liked it. All right. Well, I'm very glad to hear that. So I'm going to on our last day together. You may have noticed something in common with our last few speakers, Lexi, Dr. Smith, Dr. Goldberting. They're all from OSU. So we are going to do a little bit of a virtual tour of the campus of OSU. Um, now, just because we're doing the OSU one, if you are Boomer Sooner, tried and true, they have a virtual tour as well. You can do that on your own time. This is just kind of a way to realize that you can take these tours on online and look through these schools, but these are in no way a replacement for an actual on-campus visit. So if once, you know, these crazy times pass, you know, and hopefully that's sooner rather than later, you can schedule an actual campus visit and go on campus and see the dorms, see the library, have a student there uh, who can walk you through all those facilities. And since most of those tours, 95% of them are given by a student uh, employee, they would actually be able to answer the questions that you know, some of the professors or grown-ups aren't going to be able to do, you know, um, they'll, they'll tell you, okay, well, you know, this is probably the best place to study. Don't go to the library because it's always crowded or, you know, all the ins and outs that, you know, you won't see in the brochure. So be sure whenever you do go on an actual campus visit, have a list of questions ready. Um, there are a lot of online resources that'll have checklists. Uh, you can go to, it's the I'll actually put it in the chat box. You can go to, it's kind of the sister site to OK College Start. It has a checklist of questions to ask a student representative when you're on a campus tour. Um, so definitely take advantage of that. So we're gonna do a little bit of a virtual tour. We're not gonna do the whole thing. Uh, and then after that, we're gonna revisit OK College Start for just a little bit of a refresher. Because as I said on Monday, it feels like that was 
three years ago on Monday. Uh, this is going to be kind of your bread and butter site whenever you're planning for financial aid, whenever you're planning on what college to go to, um, all of that. Even, you know, if you're in middle school now, how to prepare for high school, because there are sometimes certain classes you need to take while you're in high school in order to really make your college application look a little better. Um, so we're going to go over that as well. I'm going to try to get through this pretty quickly. You know, it's Friday. We're not in school, but this may have kind of felt like school this week. So we got those, you know, Friday afternoon blues ready to go. Let's let's go have some good times on the weekend. So I'm going to share my screen. If you folks have any questions along the way, please unmute yourself and ask. Now this virtual tour does have a guide uh, who speaks. So I'm gonna share the computer audio as well. So listen to her, um, but yeah, just shout and I'll pause it and uh, we can talk about some stuff. So anybody have any questions before I get this started? I have a quick question, just by show of hands, how many of you have ever been on the OSU campus? Oh, quite a few hands, all right. Like I said, you don't have to go to the school you root for. There may be a school that's actually better for you but you won't get to see your favorite team play on Saturday. So do keep that in mind. That is something to think about. All right, so we're gonna share screen. Go here, share computer sound. Welcome to Oklahoma State University in Stillwater, Oklahoma. We're excited to have you explore our campus online and hope you'll make time to come see us in person. One of our most iconic buildings is the Edmund Lowe Library. The library opened as part of the then president Henry Bennett's 25 year plan for campus development. Today, the library is about so much more than books, although we have lots of those too. You'll find the coffee shop and computers with free printing. We offer technology for use and checkout, including laptops, 3D printing, cameras, GoPros, telescopes, and more. The library is often open 24 hours and is an extremely popular space for students to study at any time of day or night. Before we get started, let me explain the many ways you can explore our unique spaces. You can click on the forward facing arrow to start walking around. You can jump to the next stop by clicking on the next button. Now, if you already know where you want to go, you can select any location by using the list or by clicking directly on the map. Lastly, remember that you can explore any particular location in more detail by clicking the supplemental icons. Okay, so this is the library. As she mentioned, you can, of course, check out books, but they have a lot of different things you can check out. I'll try to do this pretty slow so as to not give anybody motion sickness. Um, I think we've got a little video here. Did you all catch that you could check out a GoPro from the library? I think it begins with the definition of library. Most, most people believe that that's just a place to check out textbooks, uh, but it's more of a place that gives resources to people, uh, either on campus or off campus. Uh, not only students are able to check these technologies out, but anyone that uh, just has an ID can check it out as well. Well, to start, we have our textbooks, uh, which are the most popular, but we also have digital cameras like Nikon point and shoots, as well as camcorders uh, that are more like uh, HD recording, uh, telescopes, high power telescopes, uh, microphones, audio recorders, uh, projectors, as well as 360 cameras uh, that are also very popular as well. Okay, so we have four rooms that are uh, available to check out to students as well, up to five hours. Um, we have a, a Windows room, uh, PC, room as well as a Mac room and each room contains audio recording devices such as a keyboard as well as a turntable and stuff like that just to perform audio recordings and uh, practice your music as well as well as it has a software like Adobe Premiere uh, just to help you those high expensive softwares are also uh, available to use here uh, we want to give the best to the students as well um, we try not to skimp out on any corners as well but our 3d printing is also uh, our large contributing factor to our most expensive uh, rooms as well, from thousands of dollars 
uh, one of our most expensive 3D printers is about $25,000 that we just recently purchased. It's, a, it's another reason to come to the library as opposed to just studying. Uh, the technology is a great factor. If someone wants to go on, if someone comes in on Friday and wants a GoPro and they want to go to Missouri and go river rafting, you can check out a GoPro and take it with you. It's a three-day checkout, so as long as you're back on the next Monday for class, then you should be fine. Yeah. So I want to see this room grow because uh, I want to see, as we grow, I want to see it grow with us. Uh, it's a great asset to this university and to the library as a whole. It not only brings people in, but it leaves them happy, and I think it's a great room overall. So that is an amazing resource. Uh, you mentioned it a couple of times, but a lot of the things they were showing you literally cost thousands upon thousands of dollars. Those 3D printers are very cool, but very pricey. So you can go into the library with a student ID and check those out and say if you're in architecture, engineering, and you have a, a 3D model that you need to print, you can actually do that with the 3D printers there. Or if you're interested in music, you can, you know, you have the turntable and the mixing board and a keyboard, like all these things that you can do there. And it's no extra cost to you. It's covered in your fees and your tuition and all that stuff. So a very cool place and um, definitely removes a lot of the financial strain of trying to do that on your own. So let's go ahead and take a look at the student union. OSU is home to one of the largest student unions in the country. The OSU Student Union includes a fabulous outdoor plaza for student events, a revamped theater, meeting rooms, a post office, 10 great dining options, including popular franchises such as Chick-fil-A and Caribou Coffee, and more. The Student Union provides plenty of space for students to participate in clubs, study, grab a bite to eat, and even get a haircut. The university store is a great place to grab your textbooks, pick up your favorite orange apparel, or the latest tech gadget. Best College Review's website listed OSU Student Union as the most amazing in the nation. So whenever they say the student union, do, do a lot of you uh, know what student union is, like what, what that sort of place is? What sort of things do you get done in the student union? I will take your silence and that you're not entirely sure. Um, essentially, they have a lot of business offices there. Typically, that's where you pay your bursar account, which is how much you owe on tuition. You know, uh, hopefully, you folks won't have to be giving them a lot of money. Hopefully it'll be scholarship entities and stuff giving them uh, the money, uh, but it's also where you get your student ID. A lot of times they have a lot of restaurants um, outside of the cafeteria. You know, most of these schools have name brand places, you know, Chick-fil-A, Sbarro Pizza, all sorts of different things. Um, and it's just a place for the students to hang out. Uh, information center is there. It's kind of like the hub of the campus. Um, Fun fact about OSU's campus, a lifetime ago, about nine years ago when they started that really big remodel, I was actually there and did the fire alarm system on that building. So if you're there, know you're safe because I helped put the fire alarms in. Uh, actually, not kidding, but that is true. Um, so we're going to do one more room and then we're going to jump over to the OK College start. Old Central was the first permanent building on OSU's campus. Over the years, it served many purposes, including the first library, home of the school newspaper, the Oak Legion, and numerous classes. The building has undergone many renovations over the years, including the restoration of classrooms to their original look. These days, the building is home to the Honors College, where students still participate in small classes, just as they did more than a century ago. The OSU Honors College is one of only 10 Honors Colleges in the nation with a five-star rated curriculum, which is the highest rating possible. We offer an honors experience that is broader, deeper, and different. Uh, so this is a cool looking room for sure. You've got the piano in the back there. You know, very small class size at the Honors College of pianos, looks like. Um, 
just a very cool room. And, you know, teachers, you know, sitting on the desk like a cool guy, you know, giving some life lessons there. But definitely, if you have time, go in and pull this up. It's just on the uh, OSU website, which is okstate.edu. Almost all of your big schools, like OU, OSU, Texas, Alabama, Louisiana State, all your big schools that have a lot of name recognition, right now they have virtual tours um, like this that will kind of walk you through. I mean, this is just the surface here. You know, we've got business building, greenhouses, mixed reality lab. We actually toured the mixed reality lab not too long ago, uh, Tasha and I and the rest of our department. And it is mind blowing. They've got virtual reality headsets and they teach interior design. And you put this headset on and you're actually in a blank house and you can build certain pieces of furniture or something and actually place it in the space so you can see what it looks like. There's augmented reality where it's just like some goggles you put on and it puts the chair that you've created in real world space. Like you can look around the classroom and see what it looks like. And it, it is insane how far technology has come in just a few years. And by the time a lot of you folks are ready to go to college, I can't even begin to tell you what it's gonna be like then. Uh, so keep an eye on these, play around, look at as many schools as you want. I mean, this costs, nothing to pull this up and to go through it. So these are some free resources to kind of get an idea of what these colleges are like. Charles, can you put that link in the chat box so that if they want to play around yeah. more, they can. And Bryden mentioned, because this looks like the next stop on the tour would have been the Endeavor Lab, and he says that he's been there, which is awesome. Oh, and I bet, I bet a lot of this looks uh, familiar to Lexi too. Yeah, th this this would take over an hour to, to go through all of this, uh, you know, for your basketball fans, of course, Gallagher Iba is on there, the dining hall, which is always something important to me, because you got to know if the food's good, and I can attest I've ate at the dining hall at OSU, it is very, very good. So, we're going to go back to OK College Start. And before we leave, I'll put that uh, link in the chat box. So we were looking the other day at exercise science because we had that lovely presentation by the folks over at the Wellness Center. So when we did that, we just merely looked at the six schools in Oklahoma that were part of the OK College Start program. Uh, however, if you go on here and look at all schools, there are 1,136 schools that you could potentially match up with by any of these uh, different factors, tuition, tuition plus room and board, all of that, if they have need-based scholarships, non-need-based scholarships, what programs are offered. And so in honor of Ms. Lexi, we are going to look up entomology. And I bet you folks know a school that already offers that, don't you? We just looked at the tour. Okay. So there are 30 schools that show up on here, of course, OSU and Stillwater, but also Auburn, if you wanna go uh, over towards Alabama, Iowa State, if you want to go up to Ames, Michigan State, all the way up Michigan. So all of these schools offer something in entomology. So as I said on Monday, don't let distance scare you. A lot of times schools may, may honor in-state tuition for a scholarship, you know, they 
schools have in-state tuition and out-of-state tuition, where out-of-state tuition means you don't live in the state that the school resides, so they charge you more to come there, but sometimes they may give you a financial aid package where they offer in-state tuition, or they just may offer more scholarships in general to where it ends up being cheaper than the school that's close by. Uh, Tasha is my prime example on this. Uh, you could probably tell a little bit more about how Notre Dame ended up being cheaper than OU would have been. Yeah, when I was applying for school, um, I looked at OU and OSU, but I knew I wanted to go someplace out of state, but I knew it would be really expensive. Well, I applied to the University of Notre Dame, the Fighting Irish up in Indiana. And when I looked at the sticker price, it was like 40 plus thousand dollars a year. And I knew there was no way we could afford that. Well, with all the scholarships I got and with the financial aid they offered me, it actually cost me less to go to Notre Dame than it would have for me to go to OU. So 49,000 a year your first year and it climbed to 59 before you ended. So I did not pay $59,000 a year because I had scholarships and other financial aid, but they had more money that they could give me in aid than OU or OSU could have. So my advice to a student is, you look at that sticker price and it looks like too much, it's always worth it just to apply and try it and then compare because you don't know what they're gonna give you until you get accepted and you fill out that FAFSA document we talked about the other day. And don't be scared, talking about sticker price, don't be scared of like Ivy League or top tier schools. Think, well, even if I got in, you know, they're charging $100,000 a year. There's no way my family could ever do that. Uh, we work fairly closely with one of the uh, Native American recruiters for Dartmouth, which is in New Hampshire, which is one of the Ivy League schools. And because they are Ivy League and they are private, but they have what's called an endowment, which essentially means the money they have to spend, their endowment is so much larger than a lot of the public schools, say OU and OSU, that they have so much more money to spend. And he was telling us about a program. Essentially, if you get accepted into Dartmouth College and your family makes less than $100,000 a year, which grand raise there, uh, you essentially will have, they will cover all your unmet needs so you can go to Dartmouth. So don't be afraid to look at those top tier schools uh, just because you think you're going to be able to afford them because they, they have money to spend on you and they want intelligent, smart, native kids to, to come on campus. So they will work really hard to get with you and they'll, they'll essentially throw money at you. So don't be scared to look at those schools. Um, I've got just a few more minutes here. So real quick, we're going to go to the financial aid planning. So I'd already logged in. So you still have your home, career planning, high school planning, college planning. So if you're in middle school, look at the high school planning. It will tell you, you know, if you're looking at this sort of level school, this is what you need to do, how you need to prepare, what classes you need to take. And then financial aid planning, the dollar signs. This is a very, very helpful page on this site. It has financial fitness, kind of helping you learn how to manage money. I am, how old am I? I'm 32. <laughs> I'm 32 years old and I'm not going to lie, folks. I still need help with managing money. I've got it down pretty well, but there are some times I, you know, get a little spend happy, a little the plastic on the cards gets to spend a little bit too easily and I go to check my bank account and you know have the home alone face. So definitely go through there and kind of look at how to manage your money. You know most of you, is it, show of hands, does anyone have a bank account like their bank account? Not mom or dad lets me spend all their money but you haven't actually have a bank account? So this is something definitely, some life skills there. Then you can build your financial aid plan. Uh, Tasha spoke yesterday about the ice cream cone, your gift aid, your earned money, and your saved money. Your earned money and your saved money, that's something you need to plan for now. Even if college seems like it's light years away, 
that may never come. I have to deal with, you know, algebra one in high school, so I'm not gonna worry about it. Go ahead and get that plan started now. Start squirreling some money away because it will come in later and it will unfortunately get eaten up pretty quick. Uh, so don't be scared to do that. And find scholarships. So she also mentioned Oklahoma's Promise. Since this website is built by the Oklahoma Board of Regents for Higher Education, you can definitely hop on here. It has a link. Boom, go straight to the Oklahoma's Promise application and get that filled out. So jump on that because even if you think your family makes too much money, you don't qualify, fill it out. And just in case something happens, of course, we don't want that to happen, but if it does, you'll be covered and you'll be able to go to a Oklahoma public institution with free tuition. And then there's just a fine scholarships database. And if it will load. You can build a scholarship profile. So you can put your ACT scores, SAT scores, if you wanna put those in there, your GPA, your extracurriculars, all of that stuff, you'll build your profile. It, it takes a while, so I'm not gonna bore you too much with that. And then it will find scholarships that match the information you put in your profile. So be sure to be honest on there so you can get the, the best scholarships for you and the ones that you're more than likely going to win. So that is a very quick, very fast rundown. Does anyone have any questions? Speaking of entomology, there's the crickets chirping as no one no one speaks up. So if you get in, get to playing with this and you wanna talk with somebody to kind of help make heads or tails of it, if it's a little overwhelming, that's what our department is for. We've been harping on it all week and we will harp on it some more. Give us a call, let's set up an advising appointment. And we'll talk through all of this with you. Uh, 405-81, uh, that's my phone number, I'm sorry. 405-695-6028. Or you can email college at potawatomi.org and we'll set that up for you. I'm glad all of you showed up this week. I hope it was fun. I hope we didn't bore you to tears. You got something out of it. And thanks for listening to me today. Thank you, Charles. And I put in the, um, the uh, chat box there, I went ahead and linked to that OSU uh, virtual tour if you want to look at that and, and see everything you can see. I also did the OU, just to be fair to the, to the Sooner fans um, on here, but there's ones for a lot of other ones too. So you can kind of scroll up. Um, and then my mom, she's on the call too. She, um, we linked to a PBS documentary that may interest you there too. And then of course we put our contact information in the chat. So just as a read it, reiterating what Charles said, I really loved having you all on and getting to see your faces and getting to know you a little bit. I hope you learned a little bit. And um, if you have any questions, you can reach out to us or your parents. I've got our contact information too. So miigwech. We'll hang out. Thank you. We'll hang out on the line for a little bit if you have anything you want to share with us. This and again, oh, go ahead. This is your mom. This is Margaret. Just an FYI for all the parents in there, that OK Promise has a deadline. If I remember correctly, you have until their sophomore year, June, the, what is considered the academic year. So you have till June 30th of their sophomore year. You don't have to wait. As long as you signed up once and you're registered on it, you're good. You don't know what your income may or may not be until they are in graduation. It is well worth signing up for Oklahoma Promise to have that in your back pocket just in case. The other link, Tasha, you sent it out for the spy in the wild. That is, there's a couple of them. There's actually a British one, but they're on PBS right now. Spy in the wild is pretty daggum cool. I think you will find some with different things um, from animals to, there may even be some bugs. Um, they're actually live on PBS. I just saw one the other night. Um, I like the little monkey one. But there's some cool ones. Spy in the Wild, and you can go actually watch. And you, um, they have um, a creature 
a animated critter that actually looks just like what they're watching. They even have some in the water, some fish ones as well. So Spy in the Wild series is awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you all. Thank you, Lexi. Thank you, Charles, for presenting and to our other presenters. And have a great rest of the summer, guys. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Yeah, <laughs> that's good, Lexi. That was really good. They were they were really into that session. Um, yeah, they were asking a lot of questions, which is good because they did a good job with Kent. But it was kind of hit or oh, I should stop recording this.